Welcome to episode number 129 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. Today we have Scott Lynch. Scott is the founder and managing director of Community Therapy. Community Therapy is a mobile, multidisciplinary allied health team of nearly 100 team members supporting older adults and people living with disabilities. Scott is a friend of mine. We live in the beautiful area of Port Stephens in Australia. And the reason that you're going to get so much value from the interviews today is that Scott has grown a business that would be within the top 1% of businesses uh, nationally. Now, very few entrepreneurs create a kind of, the kind of results that Scott has, and especially at uh, such a young age. So, uh, Scott, welcome to the episode today. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, entirely my pleasure. And I, I'm really excited to, uh, to hear from you, learn from you, and get a little bit more of an insight about your background. Now, I mentioned at such a young age, you do head up a, a large team and growing team. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you come to be a you know, create a team that's, that's you know, growing in such a great direction? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm a physiotherapist by trade. I graduated maybe, I feel like once you pass 10 years, you stop counting. So I think it's around 12 years now from um, University of Newcastle, graduated with a Bachelor of Physiotherapy, I dove straight into private practice at that stage, actually, and I was probably the typical undergraduate physiotherapist, quite sports orientated, and probably saw myself pursuing private practice um, more for younger and sports orientated um, individuals. But at that private practice, I found myself seeing primarily older adults and people living with chronic diseases. And found myself surprised that I was enjoying that type of um, clinical support much more. And I think it had to do with the complexity of the healthcare, as well as the rich stories and meaningful goals that older adults typically had at that time. So I found myself then falling into aged care. So working within residential aged care facilities with some growing companies. And then I never really had the goal of starting a business per se, but um, some of those companies went in a different direction and sort of sold at an ASX level. So, and then got purchased by overseas companies and their strategic direction changed and their culture changed a little bit. So I had the opportunity of being in the industry for maybe six or seven years at that stage. And just had some people approach me, some facility managers of residential age care facilities. Would you like to just look after our facilities yourself? And so I ventured out as a sole trader, no real great strategic goal to do anything other than enjoy what I was doing, looking after older adults and deliver a great service. And quite quickly, more facilities um, and contacts were reaching out. And it was also right at the time that there was quite a lot of funding change within aged care and disability funding within Australia with reform for community aged care, but also reform for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So started to drive around in my 1992 red Corolla with a leaky roof, um, literally had a leaky roof, as one of very few clinicians across our region and probably nationally doing private community work around that five to six years ago and now there's quite a lot of that so I guess that journey of you know what continued the growth was it was just a lot of focus on doing great work and finding other people that really wanted to deliver great clinical care as well so largely where we are at today as community therapy as a result of all the great people that I get to work alongside. Tell us about that transition though because you've gone from being an employee to being a sole trader to now heading up a a very large team. What needed to change for you maybe in your perspective, your mindset, your beliefs, like what was important for you to be able to, to expand into that? I think I've been quite fortunate that my wife, Alexa, has a background in life coaching. So that was very serendipitous in terms of that crossover to my personal growth. So there's been significant personal growth and anyone that knew me as an adolescent and a young adult realizes that, yes, I'm still fun and my usual self, but I think I've grown significantly in terms of being able to 
handle the higher end grievances and conflict that naturally come um, with interactions with a lot of human beings, whether that's in sport, whether that's in business, whether that's in politics, you get a lot of human beings around each other and there's naturally possibly going to be some friction at times. So being able to deal with that, being able to manage um, my own, I guess, stress levels and work and family balance. So putting in different strategies there. But I think from what I knew early on of business versus now, what has changed the most is how I didn't realise how much time I would be supporting other human beings. So my number one focus every day when I wake up or when I go to bed is thinking of all of the wonderful members at Community Therapy how can I support them better? And how can we as a team support all of the older adults and people living with disabilities that we have the privilege of supporting? So everything that I'm doing is supporting other human beings. And I I don't think I realised how much I would be doing those things. And I, I really love it. I really love it. I think that's that's core to it, isn't it? I think it would be difficult to uh, to wake up every day to go and do something that you hated. So the fact that you love it. Now, the key thing I take away there is, look, when you're looking for a life partner, find someone who's got the skills with life coaching. <laughs> that would be, be very helpful. <laughs> I know uh, Alexa is uh, is very gifted and, and talented in, in many ways, uh, you know, as well as the life coaching. So it's, it's always great to have a partner that uh, is very supportive of you on the journey. Um Tell me a little bit more about that, though, because like you say, you, you, you know, you, um, you know, have had times where you've got team members, there's conflict, there's grievances, there's, there's frictions. What have you been able to do now? Because presumably you're not spending uh, all day, every day, um, you know, managing the day to day of everything. You, you have some systems and processes that allow you to step back from that. Yeah, there's lots of different systems and processes in place. However, it's probably a big challenge of mine of, you know, letting go of little things and and big things because I I really like most things in business, whether it's doing payroll or checking compliance documents, reviewing contracts, chatting to team members clinically because I'm a physiotherapist, I'm a clinician, so I love doing clinical reasoning sessions. So, I still do some clinical sessions every now and again, so and probably far too many than I should in my role. But yeah, I, that's been a challenge for me and still is of what do I give up and 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 what uh, so I can fully concentrate on my role as um, a director. So yeah, that's probably my biggest growth area to focus on always is continuing to yeah build those processes. And what was the other component of your question? Uh, I, I don't know. I think you answered what I was asking perfectly. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> the key thing in there was you know the importance of letting go. And I, I see this mm. um, myself, we're, we're on this journey. There's certain things we want to keep hold of because we feel we'll do them the best. But actually, if your business is going to grow and impact more people, you, you need to be able to leverage that of others. And if you don't let go of certain things, then that's going to be the very thing that holds you back. And part of what you answered there, Scott, is great because you kind of brought us on a journey that you've gone from being a sole trader, employee to sole trader. But your identity, the thing you identified then is that you now you're director. And the work of a director isn't the same as the work of the sole trader and isn't the same as the work of the employee. So that shift in in identity and how you see yourself is totally key. Now, one of the questions we love to ask on on this show is around um, life changing questions. And we may have heard your answer already. because You've already asked a a bit of a pearl of a question uh, right there in the the front section. But we say one of the um, the quality of the questions we ask ourselves impact the quality of our, our life. With that being true, I wonder, is there one question that you've asked that's had the biggest positive impact on your life or the life of the people that you serve? Yeah, in terms of, I think I do this in personal life as well, but in terms of, you know, at community therapy and and other things that I'm involved with at, I guess, a professional level is I tend to always ask myself the question, if it was simple, what would it look like? So if that, and typically it's around processes and systems, but from a business perspective, but it's also a really healthy question to ask from a clinical perspective. So we deliver clinical services, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech, diet, exercise, physiology, lots of different services. And 
typically what happens from a new graduate level as a clinician all the way through to a really experienced senior clinician that's 10 or 20 years out, that difference can be of their ability to simplify quite complex clinical situations. So I'm always asking that question of if it was simple, what, what would it look like? There's real power in that question. If it was simple, what would it look like? What, what impact has that had overall in your business? I, I can hear how you can help maybe the, uh, the newer people coming through take something complex and make it simple. That really would help your clinicians. But what about when you ask that question in relation to the business, has that helped you? Uh, I think it helps a lot with simplifying and streamlining systems and processes. So at the moment, and I think there's different sort of leaps in the business journey where you come back to systems and processes. Is that fit for purpose now? Does it have to be changed? Is it now redundant? Is it replaced? Um, and we're going through some of that again at the moment. And we were looking at our what we do to triage incoming referrals because there's a high demand on our services at present. Some of that at the time of recording is due to a, a surge in um, COVID-19 as well as respiratory, other respiratory conditions, influenza, et cetera, through the winter of um, 2022 here in New South Wales. So we have been looking at our triage systems and, and how we contact um, consumers and clients and, and patients that are on our wait lists. And when we were looking at that process and, and where those contacts could be and what that system would look like, we pursued it from a simple strategy. So what systems did we have already in place? And rather than plugging in some new CRM automated system, we were able to map that out and look at if this was simple, what would it look like? What has minimal touch points, but still you know, provides that outcome that we're looking for? So I think that question from a business and process point of view always leads us to having not having too much bulk and redundant systems. We're continuing to sort of tear them down and, and simplify them and, and combine them where we can. It's a very powerful question. And I think as business grows, we can get into the position where we bolt this bit on and bolt this bit on and bolt this bit on, but actually stopping and asking that question, if it was simple, what it would look like really allows us to kind of rationalize and make things efficient, very effective. I love that question. And in 129 episodes, no one else has asked that question, Scott. So it's very unique. And I love that. Oh, lovely. I, very good. I, I want to pull, I want to pull on something else you said before though. And I wondered if this was your question, because I, the, the question you kind of included a little bit before was also great there. And it's a question you ask every day, which is how can I support my team uh, and my, you know, and my customers better? How can I support you know, the people I serve better? That is also a really powerful question. If you didn't pick up on that one while Scott shared that, I think it's really worthwhile thinking about and whatever you're doing in your day-to-day -day life, uh, you know, how, how can you do that better? How can you serve and support people better as well? So two very powerful questions there from Scott. Uh, Scott, we kind of already can hear that one of your habits that you, you have is around making sure you have good systems and streamline the systems and processes. Would you attribute uh, your, your focus on systems to uh, being part of the reason why your business has been able to grow so successfully? Oh, a hundred percent. So, um, and that's, that's systems from everywhere, systems from your personal systems, like how I go about my day, what sort of systems I have in place or rituals, all different words for sort of things that we're doing repeatedly for an outcome to look after my own well-being and then that flowing through for my ability to serve others, but then through to, you know, actual business and system processes. So, okay, what's happening with our bad debt as a company? Are we not serving our clients with giving them an easier way to receive our invoices, be reminded about their invoices and, and pay their invoices? So, putting in a, a simple system for, you know, accounts receivable follow-up and all of these sorts of things, yeah, really it is all systems and processes. And I think the complexity there is making sure that you aren't getting those bulked out and complex and like what you've said, just bolting things on because you saw some other company say that they did it on LinkedIn and it must be a great idea, but taking that time to reflect of, where does this fit in? Where does that fit in with our strategic and operational plan? What are our risks around this? 
we're always thinking if we're putting in a process, who is it serving? Is it making something better? Or is this just generating a report for someone to look at? Is it actually serving our consumers, our clients? Is it actually serving our team and making that experience better for all parties involved in the process? And for us, it has to tick all of those boxes. Um, or sometimes there will be a double-edged sword to a system. You may improve some things in one side of the fence, but there may be some slight frictions that it introduces. Making sure those frictions are identified and then clearly communicated to who may experience those frictions. I think you've made a really valid point around clearly communicate, communicating because I guess uh, systems are operated by people and people experience those systems. And if we don't uh, don't get that communication right, we have the best system in the world. But if people don't really understand it or understand the impact of it, then that's going to cause a bigger issue as well. Hmm. Uh, you mentioned about personal systems. I, I'm really intrigued about the habits and rituals. I, I get very clearly you have a, a very great habit and ritual around making sure those systems and processes and the team are well communicated with. Are there any other habits and rituals that you've had uh, over the years that you feel really serve you personally and professionally? Yeah, the number one thing that I always harp on to everyone across our team, but also stakeholders. So I'm often speaking to residential aged care facility managers, community aged care managers, NDIS coordinators, et cetera, people that may have a lot on their plate um, and need some sort of strategy around wellbeing um, is what is that for people? And for me, that's been guided breathing. So I do quite a lot of guided breathing, some that pretty much every day, I may skip a day every now and again, but it's allowed me to become yeah, very in tune with when do I feel that, and I'm clinical, so I'm always probably going to think quite clinical on these things. When am I shifting between maybe a parasympathetic and sympathetic state? So more of layman's terms there might be sort of that fight or flight or rest and digest, like when are you shifting to one and the other? And we know there's an optimal stress curve, but when am I looking to you know have some balance and pull myself back down into more of a sympathetic state so then I can rise again um, into that sympathetic um, state again. So guided breathing, I love the Calm app. I use that quite a lot. Typically, it's just breathing. Other times I might use, you know, soundscapes or different um, uh, music to listen to, but really focusing on breathing. And I'd say the other small component there in terms of a ritual would be physical activity. Obviously, as a physiotherapist, I'm going to say that, but um, I would say at a younger age, I was quite focused on strength. Um, so, you know, weightlifting, et cetera. And I certainly still do that now, but I've introduced a lot of yoga. So, and once again, that's a lot of forced guided breathing because you sort of can't hide from that breathing when you're doing yoga. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. If you think you're breathing right, it's, it's not gonna help. And I can understand why that makes such a big difference because uh, if we don't get our breathing right, then our energy is not gonna be great. Our focus isn't gonna be great. Um, and I know uh, you and I, we were speaking about a book uh, we read recently, uh, it was up by Nestor, uh, and I think the book's called Breathe. I was, mm. uh, I was on my way to realize and for myself, always to have been a mouth breather, I didn't realize the impact of, you know, just shutting this one and, and using the nose more. And what a difference that makes to uh, your energy, your concentration, your focus. So uh, it's, it's such a great, uh, great tip, a great piece of wisdom there for us to, to use that. Um, one of the habits that you didn't mention that I recognize uh, very strongly in you, every time I speak to you, there's, you know, you probably flown through another five books, you know, and <laughs> you mm. read uh, voraciously, I, I don't think I've met anyone who absorbs quite as much as you, quite as uh, quite as quickly as you do. So, why don't you tell us a little about your your habit around that? Is there uh, something that you you really learn along the way, or is there some some book or some wisdom? Or tell us a little bit about your reading habit. Yeah, I I think where it might, might have came from is early on with community therapy. I did a lot of days in a row, and I was really and still am very passionate about what I was doing. But at that time in the, the journey, I, you know, was working seven days a week. I think at one stage I probably did 120 to 140 days in a row. And, um, and then it sort of probably settled into a six day a week rhythm, but all of those 
days were quite a lot of time driving. So that was driving from where I was living to maybe two hours away to a different region to start services in that region clinically and then, you know, driving home. So I might have been doing hours and hours of driving a day. And what I started to listen to during that time was just a lot of podcasts and audio books. And I just really loved that. I was listening to a lot of clinical things as well. So around healthcare and aged care and disability, but also then quite a lot of business books, business podcasts, and 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 I guess what you would classify as around that sort of professional life coach sort of, you know, sector as well. So, um, yeah, I found myself continuing to just, you know, yearn for more and more knowledge. So I've always got, yeah, audio books going, little subscription to Audible, and um, I tend to be, at the moment, I tend to be quite focused on audio books. I haven't pulled myself back to podcasts for a while, and I think I'm finding myself, yeah, searching into other areas to pull some insights across and an example would be that that breathing book so that's you know you would classically go okay what does that have to do with business or you know what you're doing but I'm looking for insights from other areas now not always from just listening to how Google did things or something. Wonderful and I, I think those uh, ideas cross-pollinating from different areas uh, typically will, will help as well. If there is one book, and I know you've read so many, so this is, is the most challenging question. If there was one book that you think would be really valuable for our listeners to get hold of read, or one book that's had maybe big impact on your life, what would that be? Yeah, it's a hard question when there's so many, and I'm actually just oh, yeah. pulling up <laughs> Audible at the moment because I'm really enjoying the book that I'm listening to right now. Um, I'm maybe 25% of the way into it. And at present, I'm putting it at the top of my list, um, which maybe it's more so that's just what I'm looking for and yearning in terms of what I'm, yeah, from a learning perspective of where I'm, my focus is at the moment. But serendipitously, I've landed on this book and I'm really liking it. So it's called Thinking Fast and Slow um, by... I'll butcher the last name, so I won't go for it. So thinking fast, you mean oh, you've acted, I mean the one you've literally just held up. That is very weird. It's, it's um, me. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it, really enjoying reflecting on my own cognitive biases um, and what has shaped my beliefs and, ex- and expectations of situations that I encounter. And what I can do to consciously think different, to challenge my own biases, beliefs and expectations. And that sits very well with me as a clinician as well, because we a part of clinical work, as many allied health professionals will learn about cognitive behavioural therapy and, and sort of, you know, challenging and, and supporting clients, patients to go on a, an educational journey about their beliefs and experience about their healthcare or their condition. So yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying that book, highly recommended. I love it. It's such a great recommendation. And I think uh, exploring and understanding our own biases uh, can be very powerful. We see things from our model of the world and our perspective and our view. And I think if we understand, well, what are some of the, the, the potentially limitations or the things it's cutting us off from, then it opens up to us up to a lot of uh, different thinking. In an earlier episode, I'm trying to think it was maybe episode 124, 125, we had Kevin Pates on, and one of his questions was, is that true? And I think it goes to the heart of that. He's really challenging sometimes the senior executives that he works with you know, on their biases. The things that they say, if we examine, is it true? Sometimes the perception uh, that we have isn't quite the same as reality. We can look at things from a different lens or different perspective. So I love that recommendation, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel. And I will butcher the name. I think it's Kahneman, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'll take it. <laughs> uh, and OK, one, I have one final question for you because you've been uh, you provide such wisdom and value and insight in today's call. I'd like to ask a little bit about your bucket list. Is there one thing you know, or something that you've really been proud to have accomplished uh, so far, or is there something that you have on your list that you really want to uh, to still uh, you chase down and pursue for the future? 
Oh, big question. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, be, we'll be on the show. definitely unprepared. <laughs> um, let's let's attack that from two ways, maybe personal and professional. So, I would say say that I'm really proud of um, our family. So not just myself and Alexa and our two beautiful children, but um, I feel that I've done a better job as a, a, a grandson and a son and a brother and, and a friend. So I feel that I really set myself the goal of the recent years of yeah improving uh, my relationships with those in my personal circle and am looking to continue that. So that's probably a focus point, a bucket list. Um, and then in terms of professionally, I think I think I always struggle on reflecting on those um, on these sorts of things professionally because you do naturally start to get those questions when you know in quotations you achieve some sort of success professionally. So I think I'm I'm really proud of who I'm surrounded by at Community Therapy. We have some really talented individuals, whether that's um, across all areas of the business, accounts, our administration team, through to all of our clinicians and our leadership team, but then, you know, further to some of our key stakeholders and partners. There's just some really wonderful people that are aligned to our mission and vision and values. So, and I understand I should take some credit for those, you know, how that has come about. So I think it's much more beyond me now than but I know and recognise I'm a big part of that. And then in terms of where we're going in the future, we're, we're just really focused on our mission to really support older adults and people living with disabilities with face-to-face -face services across our region and then looking to extend that reach beyond our region with certain digital and, and educational solutions for both the sector and and consumers so that's sort of I guess a bucket list sort of thing that we're looking for and you know certain strategic and operational items around there but professionally I'm, I'm just really really proud and privileged and blessed to be surrounded by who I am. What a, uh, a beautiful perspective you have as a leader and I think if I was on your team I'd be very uh, very happy to hear that so Scott you're very humble with all the things that you've personally accomplished. And for the listeners today then, that key question, um, if it was simple, what would it look like? Take your time to ask that question in your business and even in your personal life, if it was simple, what would it look like? And what could you do to make things uh, more simple, more rational, more efficient, more effective? So really valuable question, Scott. Uh, I'm so grateful to have had the time with you today. Thank you so much for your time and your energy. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me.